Now we're ready to look at water filtration and reabsorption in the nephron. So remember that you have about five liters of blood total. In general, it takes about five minutes to run all five liters of blood through your kidneys. So you filter the same blood over and over several times a day. Each time you filter your blood, water is removed. So water is a small molecule, and it's going to come out of the glomerulus and go into the filtrate. So here's the amazing number. You have five liters of blood. But in a single day, you will remove 180 liters of water from your blood. Take a look at this fish tank. This is a big fish tank. This fish tank holds about 180 liters of water. In one day, that's how much water your kidneys are taking out of your blood. Now, think about how much urine is produced. We already covered that in an earlier video. How much urine do you make per day in general? So you get about two liters per day of urine. That means that you're reabsorbing 180 liters per day. I may have said 180 there. I meant to say 178 if I did. You reabsorb 178 liters per day. So you have three main processes that you're reabsorbing all this massive amount of water. Number one is right here, the 65% obligatory water reabsorption in proximal convoluted tubule. So this one is about sodium. Your proximal convoluted tubule reabsorbs sodium. And remember, water follows salt. The water follows the sodium. So 65% of that 178 liters that you're reabsorbing is following sodium back into your blood through the proximal convoluted tubule. Number two occurs down here at your loop. This is 10% of your reabsorption in the loop. The loop has two parts. If we think about the flow of tubular fluid, remember tubular fluid is coming from the proximal convoluted tubule and it's going down and then it curves and it goes back up. This side is the descending limb. This side is the ascending limb. The descending limb is where the fluid is going down. That's why it's called descending. And the ascending limb is where the fluid is going up. Blood flow is the opposite direction. The blood is going this way. Oops. So the blood and the fluid flow in opposite directions of each other. This is called countercurrent flow.
So the ascending limb of the loop has transport proteins that move salts into the blood. So salts would be moving into the blood right here. Then those salts are flowing this way with the blood. Those salts get over to the descending limb. Water follows salt. So now you have this salty blood next to that tubular fluid in the descending limb and it draws the water out by osmosis. Then the third method is over here, the regulated reabsorption. So this is called regulated because hormones control it. And you can change the level of the hormones in order to change how much water you reabsorb here. Okay, and notice this occurs in the distal convoluted tubule, the collecting tubule, and the collecting duct. So it's all this area and this area where you're gonna, where the hormones will act. So we have two main hormones that are gonna act here. We have aldosterone. And remember, we already talked about it. It causes the nephron to have more sodium potassium pumps. And these pumps move sodium to the blood and water follows. So the more aldosterone you have, that means the more sodium potassium pumps you have, which means more sodium into the blood, which means more water to the blood. So the higher your aldosterone, the more water you reabsorb. And then that means you would have less urine since you're reabsorbing more water. The other hormone that acts here is ADH, or antidiuretic hormone. We talked about this hormone in chapter 20. ADH is from the posterior pituitary gland. It stimulates the nephron to have proteins called aquaporins. Aquaporins are transport proteins for water.
they move water into the blood. So the more ADH you have means the more aquaporins you have, which means more water reabsorbed. So that is water reabsorption. You have 180 liters leave per day, but through these three methods, you get 178 of those back, and you have two liters of urine. The next one to look at is calcium and phosphate. So this goes back to chapter seven. You're gonna to have to think back to chapter seven for a few things. The first thing to think back to chapter seven for is what is the job of PTH? which this stands for parathyroid hormone. So think back to chapter seven, figure that out. Okay. The job of PTH is to raise blood calcium. So the whole point of PTH is it wants more calcium in your blood. You know that calcium enters your bones. Remember we talked about bones are the bank of calcium. But if you recall, calcium doesn't enter your bone alone. It has a partner. In order for calcium to enter the bone, it has to combine with phosphate and they form hydroxyapatite. And this is what then enters the bone. The goal of PTH is to keep calcium in the blood. One of the ways to keep calcium in the blood is to prevent it from entering the bone. and you can prevent it from entering the bone by taking away its partner. So if you notice here, PTH inhibits the reabsorption of phosphate. This means that PTH causes phosphate to be lost in the urine. So if it's lost in the urine, it's therefore not in your blood. So now, calcium can't go into the bone because it doesn't have its partner, and the calcium is trapped in your blood.
PTH also makes sure that you reabsorb calcium. So you're raising the calcium level and decreasing the phosphate level in the blood when you have PTH. Our final topic here is pH. So we've talked before about the importance of pH in the blood. So remember what is the pH homeostasis level of blood? So you have to keep your blood pH at 7.4. That's very important. And you have two organs that do this. In the last chapter, we learned about the lungs that exhale carbon dioxide in order to keep your pH at 7.4. Now we're going to see how your kidneys will put hydrogen or bicarbonate in the urine in order to balance blood pH. There's two different types of cells in the kidneys. We're going to have type A cells and type B cells. We'll look first at the type A. These cells are used in most people. Most people have an excess of hydrogen. This means that you need to get rid of the hydrogen. So type A cells will send hydrogen to the tubular fluid so that it can then be lost in the urine. They will send bicarbonate back into the blood. So you're always sending hydrogen and bicarbonate in opposite the directions. This way you will lose hydrogen in the urine. And that way you can keep your blood pH at 7.4 by getting rid of the excess hydrogen. The other type of cell is the type B. In some circumstances, such as being a vegetarian, you actually want to keep the hydrogen. So then you will use your type B cells. Type B cells send hydrogen to the blood and they send bicarbonate to the tubular fluid to be lost in the urine. So if you're using your type B cells, you lose bicarbonate in your urine and you keep the hydrogen and then that keeps your blood at 